Okay, we've reached 11.35. Um, Andy and Rob, can you still hear me? Yes, fine. Yeah, we can. Thank you. Can you also give me a quick, uh, uh, let me know whether you can see my screen? Yep. Okay, on that basis, uh, I will assume that the attendees can also hear and see me. I'm here both uh, well, and hear my colleagues too, of course. I will now uh, I will now start the presentation. Uh, so th first of all, thank you very much for um, for those of you, particularly for those of you who've joined the session early. Uh, it seems that uh, summertime and summertime and time zones have, do make uh, things a little bit more complicated. Okay, so anyway, we're we're here now. Um, just to explain very briefly the structure of the presentation, um, I'm going to begin with a with an overview of the application um, and predictive maintenance in general from a Sensei perspective, and then I will ask uh, Andy Graham from Wonderware to introduce uh, his application as part of that presentation, and then we will um, also have a demonstration at the end of the of the application. <laughs> You're all currently in muted mode, except for the presenters. Um, the, I will unmute the microphones at the end of the session during a Q&A session. So it's 30 minutes worth of presentation, 20 minutes worth of, um, of a demonstration, and 10 minutes worth of questions. Um, it's helpful if you would add your questions into the chat box. We will try and answer as many of the questions as possible. Um, and okay, without further ado, I will then continue. So the title of the presentation is Scalable Predictive Maintenance. Now I did actually have a, 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 another title previously, which was uh, Real Predictive Maintenance. And I chose that, that provocative title deliberately as uh, there are an awful lot of companies out there that claim to do predictive maintenance, uh, particularly those that uh, tackle predictive maintenance from a big data perspective. Real maintenance really, to me, certainly means uh, having the, 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 not only the insight, but also being able to apply mechanical know-how to that insight when you have a f uh, about the health of your machines. So Sensei is in the business of providing uh, an application with automated condition monitoring and prognostics. Prognostics, uh, I'll cover that in more detail in a moment. Prognostics is the understanding um, or the science of, of understanding the remaining useful life of, of assets, which is a, um, a, um, a piece of science in its own right that's been taken from, from, from very much from, from an academic um, background to something that's really uh, you know, in a, in an industrial application. Um, I will now quickly ask Rob uh, to introduce himself as the CEO of the company. Hi, yeah, so um, I'm uh, Rob Russell, I'm the Chief Technical Officer at Sensei, uh, responsible for uh, product delivery. Um, background is as a mechanical systems engineer, working within the, the domain of uh, condition monitoring and prognostics, primarily within aerospace and defence before starting Sensei in 20. 14. Thank you, Rob. And Thanks, uh, Rob. our guest today, Andy Graham from Wonderware. Would you mind introducing Thanks, yourself? Lars. So, yeah, so I'm uh, Andy Graham. I'm the product manager for Wonderware UK and Ireland. And um, we actually work for a company called Solutions PT, but we trade as Wonderware UK and Ireland. Okay, excellent. Thank you. All right, I shall move on. We have quite a lot of material to, to go through, so I will try not to speak too fast. Um, okay, just a little bit about, about the company. Since I was started uh, almost four years ago, um, it's doubled in size since last year in terms of employees. Most of the companies uh, filled with condition monitoring and engineering, mechanical engineering experts, uh, as well as a team of uh, PhDs uh, work on the algorithms and data science aspect. Uh, we're currently monitoring over two and a half thousand machines globally for our customers. Uh, we have our headquarters in Southampton in the UK, as well as 
um, a strategic site up in Sunderland for one of our uh, major um, clients, as well as uh, offices in Stuttgart and uh, other employees spread out um, across the globe. Andy, would you mind uh, introducing Wonderware for me? Yeah, sure. So uh, I mentioned at the beginning that we are actually Solutions PT, but because we have sole distributor rights of Wonderware in the UK and Ireland, we we are allowed to trade as Wonderware UK and Ireland. So that's exactly what we do. And we were established in 1985, so we've been doing this for a very long time. Um, we're about 80 plus employees, so we we have a wealth of experience and knowledge, and we have lots of people with. Um, uh, a big technical background in the organization. We're, we're probably about half and half in terms of technical and sales, which is un, unusual for a, a company like ourselves. And our headquarters is in Cheadle, which is in the Manchester area in the north of England. Excellent, thank you. Okay, so just very quickly, the uh, the, the overview of what Sensei does. So Sensei uh, has proven to reduce downtime by 50%. So that's actually from an existing um, engagement we have with the customer. Uh, we are we deliver on this commitment by uh, providing early insights, allowing you to carry out minor repairs to prolong the life of your machine assets, and that's the key point there. That's prognostics there. Uh, Sensei is a sensor, sensor is a is, da is data and IoT agnostic. And its approach allows uh, insights to be shared across manufacturing plants in a highly scalable SaaS application uh, that's incredibly easy to use. And we've built in our expertise so that you can focus on achieving your production KPIs and, in, and, and innovating. So three key points there, agnostic, scale, and trust. Okay, to follow on from that theme, um, a slightly provocative slide um, to cover the three main um, aspects that I'd like you to take away from this session. It's always people process technology. Um, so collecting, collecting data, uh, whether you want to use the term data lake or not, is very, very useful. And we need to work with companies that have access to data. But very often, have it, data, having lots of data doesn't necessarily mean you have a lot of insights. So that's why you know, data rich, insight poor. Uh, I put again agnostic at the bottom of the process uh, box there. Again, because we are open to all data sources. The next component, technology, we are, we are um, providing scalability uh, to our clients through um, mechanically focused machine learning algorithms that we've developed ourselves. So these are not inherited or borrowed from the internet. Uh, these are built from the ground up um, with our data scientists and our condition monitoring experts that sit together and write these algorithms. Um, and then people um, and trust. So. Um, Having having uh, a data, having the data available, providing insights, half the story. And that's often often what a lot of big data analytics company believe is enough to be able to provide a predictive maintenance solution. For, for successful predictive maintenance, you need to have the data, you need to have the insight, but more important, or equally importantly, you need to have the inbuilt mechanical engineering knowledge to interpret those trends. That then results in true scalability. So very, very quickly, the, just to make the point that we are, we understand uh, the challenges within all the organizations, our own and every other organization suffers from, from complex uh, infrastructures that lead to manual processes, uh, disparate opera, uh, operations causing data silos, and the organizational makeup leading to poor visibility. And we're in the business of breaking down the manual processes by automation, uh, providing the insight, uh, making the, uh, breaking down the, the um, the data silos by ensuring we have traceability, um, visibility of all the insights to all colleagues across the organization. Um, and uh, we are also tackling, of course, all the other complexities within a business. Um, the what a ring fence there is a big data ex exhaustion on the right hand side, uh, as well as uh, ensuring that you can increase your throughput, as well as helping with the servantization models, like tackling cost pressures, agility, certification, regulation, sh skills shortages, all, all these classic challenges. The cost of manufacturing downtime um, is very well understood um, and um, perhaps shocking to some, uh, but 24% of total manufacturing costs is attributed to downtime. And 90% um, of all maintenance work is categorized as critical uh, crisis, uh, crisis work to fix breakdowns. 
and uh, breakdown in uh, um, downtime within the automotive sector uh, is two and a half million per hour. These are well-known statistics that come from the likes of McKinsey. Okay, just to um, go through some of the, uh, the pains of traditional condition monitoring. Con uh, condition monitoring in its traditional sense is uh, expensive and periodically performed. Uh, it's time consuming, it requires specialist knowledge to interpret it. It's incredibly difficult to scale and insight is very rarely shared across sites. However, I will say it can be accurate. KPIs, so um, we help companies with addressing key KPIs. So I've listed some of the key ones here. Uh, overall equipment efficiency, um, uh, ensuring uh, increase in quality, reducing scrap and waste, ensuring availability in plant uptime, and ensuring um, performance throughput, as well as production efficiency, equipment efficiency, and reducing the cost of maintenance. This is a slide I put together to map the different uh, terminology, I suppose the terminology within uh, the maintenance sector. So we have planned, uh, reactive and planned maintenance, of course not, not, not an ideal scenario to be in. That's why I grouped it in as poor and good. Um, and as we move, uh, move along this, uh, this, this, this curve up to the right hand corner, we move from, from poor to better and best. And we're helping companies move along this transition up to prognostics, predictive maintenance. So Sensei really kicks in with uh, detection and um, providing uh, automated uh, con um, condition monitoring indicators, as well as uh, diagnostics, suggesting potential failure modes, and also giving companies the under an understanding of the remaining useful life of their machines. The reasons for predictive maintenance, for most of you will probably be full, fully aware of these. However, just, I'll just rattle through some of them. It's, it's to reduce downtime, ultimately. Um, and we uh, want to, of course, um, have early issue detection. Uh, we want to have insight in real time, as close to real time as possible. Um, it also helps us to reduce the, the cost of our spares, uh, increase our labor efficiency, improve safety, reduces lost production time, and supports cultural change, and reduces the cost of labor equipment and labor. Sensei is a uh, cloud application, and uh, I put this slide together to really make the point that we are helping with the challenges that I addressed before, in that we're ensuring that um, we're ensuring collaboration and al allowing colleagues to focus on innovation, not on uh, what I may call IT exercises. Uh, we are um, help yeah, it, it allows companies to to uh, with their economies of scale. It is uh, an incredibly safe application using um, financial level encryption levels, um, encryption mechanisms, and it is a it's a SaaS application, so it's always accessible, always on, and all the maintenance, all the updates are already pushed auto uh, automatically to our clients. Another key point is that it's not just a, um, it's not just a piece of software. You're actually um, we're actually ensuring that uh, we are cultivating a culture of change within our within the organizations that we're working with. So it's not just the uh, the machine learning methods that we deliver, but also uh, embracing uh, existing processes, ensuring that the right people, the right insights delivered to the right people, uh, and without specialist knowledge. And we do that through regular review sessions and. Um, regular training sessions bringing new colleagues on board before handing on to 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 my colleagues in a moment i'm just going to um, explain where sensei sits sensei sits effectively at the end of the iot chain we need to work with organizations that have access to data from the factory networks to the ot networks to mes systems fact, uh, factory historians cloud platforms enterprise systems and iot platforms such as Wonderware. Um, we're at the end of that chain and we interface back and forth through uh, an API into the enterprise layer or via the uh, via the front end that you can access through a browser. 
And at this stage, I'm going to pass over to my colleague Rob uh, to introduce the, the flow and also allow Andy to explain where he fits in from a wonder wonderware perspective. Okay, th thank you very much, Lars. Um, so, um, just to explain, uh, Sensei actually builds on top of existing uh, data sources. Um, our expectation is that data has been gathered for the purposes of condition monitoring. So, the condition monitoring sensors um, are, are, are available within the factory environment. Um, in many cases, that can actually be data that's extracted um, from existing process and control capability. Um, that data needs to find its way to the cloud, so secure mechanisms are required to um, have that data um, pass through gateways and then on into an IoT hub. Um, and in this case that we're talking here along uh, with our colleagues from Wonderware, they actually nicely fill a lot of that technology stack right from sensor through to uh, the, the cloud platform where we, we're able to integrate our application and then deliver business benefit on top of that. Um, I'll hand across to uh, Andy. Thanks, Rob. Uh, yeah, that's a, a very good overview and a good overview from you, Lars. Um, I think it's always important to, to show some of those challenges. And these are challenges that we see on a regular basis as well. So the, this is the reason that Wonderware have been working with Sensei for the last couple of years to, to try and um, get this predictive maintenance solution in, into, into fruition. Um, the last couple of slides that we just talked about introduce where Wonderware sits in all of this. Um, so this is obviously at the, the factory and IoT level. Um, we, therefore, from our previous business, we have lots of customers who have lots of real-time SCADAs out there, and we've got a few in our portfolio um, so that they can connect to things like their PLCs, uh, their assets, any of these low-cost sensors, small sensors, the condition sensors that Rob was just referring to, um, and very similar to the way that Sensei work, we're extremely scalable. Um, we are agnostic, so we don't really care what device you're communicating to. Um, we don't even care how you're getting the data out. We, we can pretty much connect to anything to do that, and which I suppose is why it makes it so appealing for, for Sensei to then just bolt on top of there. Um, but System Platform is, is the solution that we have been promoting for a long time, uh, and this is our enterprise SCADA. And this is what really helps us to deliver much more at a, at a plant level. And the next slide goes into a little bit more detail around that and then how Sensei fits in with this. Um, so we have a much larger stack than that. And the whole point of this is that we can go from device level all the way up to our enterprise level. And um, so we can introduce things like MES, uh, business analytics, alarm analysis, et cetera, et cetera. Um, However, what we've now seen with the advancements of cloud technologies and where we've moved to um, is that we can now um, store data from any part of this stack into that cloud-based solution. Um, so it's hosted centrally in the world. We can connect to um, a single plant, multiple factories, lots of sensors, lots of data being stored centrally to a, a, um, a, a cloud-based historium. And then the whole point around what Lars mentioned earlier with the APIs, um, since I then have this native API connection into the, that cloud platform. So with, there's lots of benefits with cloud. Um, Lars has mentioned a few already, but things like zero infrastructure costs. Um, you know, you're looking at um, great SLAs with these types of solutions, so they're readily available. Um, and then because they're both online solutions, um, all you have to worry about is making sure you've got that secure connection outbound from the plant layer. And we do that very well from a, a system platform perspective. Um, then if we just move on slightly, because this online cloud platform has taken us a little bit further than that. So um, yes, we do have lots of customers that connect from plant locations, but we certainly have now um, gone scaled it down or gone to the, the much lower end, if you like, because lots of weird and wonderful devices have come online. Um, yes, you've got your big plays and the PLCs, but things like MQTT protocol, the, the message queue telemetry transfer, these are the types of things that work on devices that can be even battery powered for a number of years and just send very low cost, low powered energy data or temperature data straight up to the cloud. Um, Rob mentioned security earlier and, and that is key 
uh, and we, we are heavily focused on security and we still adopt the same security levels going out, whether it's this type of solution or whether it's from uh, a complete plant floor. Um, and then obviously Sensei still connects in at that, that cloud platform because it doesn't really care what we do underneath it. As long as we get that data into that cloud historian, Sensei can then work their magic on it. Um, so it's really just a whistle stop tour into Wonderware and a brief introduction. Um, but if obviously there's more questions, um, please, please feel free at the end. And now I'm going to do is hand back to Rob and he's going to cover uh, a bit more in-depth information around what Sensei deliver and how they do that and then go into the demo. Great. Th thank you very much, um, Andrew. Um, it's great. Yes, yeah, so just before uh, going into the demo, I just want to give um, a short overview of the um, underlying features and technology um, that we have within Sensei. Um, so what, what we can see um, here is um, a typical example of uh, several failures that have happened on a machine over time. Um, and what we're, um, what we're showing is the, um, the, 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 in the early stages using Sensei, we actually pick up on the behavior of the machine and assess and build models that reflect normal behavior. So uh, the purple markers is showing where we start to detect systems moving out of that normal bound. Now, if we've got the luxury of being able to process historic data with maintenance records, we can look back into that data set and spot unscheduled maintenance events. Um, and from those, we're able to build our prognostic models. Um, and once we've got those prognostic models established, it gives us the capability of looking for the early signs and the early detection of, uh, of, of failure within the system. Um, then subsequent failures, um, you have the opportunity, as well as looking for those, those differences in abnormal behavior, you can utilize the prognostics to supplement um, the information that the system's delivering to you and um, get, get a much earlier indication uh, of the machine state and an estimate of the remaining useful life. Most of our users uh, really want to understand, once we start to tell them that the machine's entering a degraded state, how much risk they're running uh, and what type of action they need to be taking. Um, and then as you move forward, you're able to intervene in the machines at a much earlier stage uh, and perform minor maintenance actions and capture failures at, and, and during that first failure mode rather than having to hit into secondary damage that could result in substantial changes to assets. Um, so I'm going to ask Lars to give me control if he stops sharing and I will, uh, uh, I will give you a demo of the system. Hang on one second. Uh, whoops. There we are. Thank you, Lars. Okay. <clears throat> so here we have the uh, Sensei application. As we've explained, it's a cloud-based app. Now the focus for us is uh, getting information into a format that can um, be delivered to maintenance teams and maintenance personnel. Um, we want to have performed the, the majority of the analysis on the data uh, in an automated manner. Um, in many of our accounts, we're monitoring hundreds and thousands of machines. The, the largest account we have, I believe it's, it's around about uh, 2,000 2, machines that we're monitoring across a plant. Um, in this example here, it's purely test data that we've got running through for demonstration purposes. But one thing I'd like to explain is how you would connect systems uh, sensors into the system. So within the settings page, we've got our sensor area here. And I've got some sensors here that have already been connected and streaming through from Wonderware. Um, we can see the type of measures that we have coming from these sensors in here. Um, and really, once, once we've got that connection through to the sensors, and there's, there's capability in here for users to add new sensors in or we can provide a service where we utilize tools that we have to bulk load sensors. So if we wanted to load up you know, uh, hundreds of sensors at a time, we, we can go through a process of that and provide the support to do that. 
Um, after the sensors in the system, we need to have an understanding of where that fits within the factory. So the, this is a fictitious factory that we have set up here. Um, and what I'll do is I'll just create uh, a machine in here. Um, so I'll add an asset, that's our vocabulary for this sort of end machine. Um, and it's, we'll call it a gear cutting motor. We'll add that in. And then over in this little drawer I've got on the side, I can see my orphaned sensors. So sensors I have in the system that don't yet have a place in the hierarchy. And it's as simple as dragging and dropping that over and connecting that through uh, onto the system. Save the hierarchy off with that new change. And now that the system is ready to start processing that sensor um, and we'll start to generate insights. Typically, we want to have a period of time where we build a models of normal behavior for the machine before those insights are generated. Other pieces of information we can provide for the machine is here we have it here. We can tell uh, the system what sort of uh, asset it is. Um, and uh, we'll, in this case, we'll call it an electric motor and save that. Um, these are sort of, this is a type of information that uh, users provide to us in metadata and data streams where we can extract from IoT hubs automatically. Okay. So if I just go back to um, our main screen here, this is where users would normally uh, work. So at this level, I'm at the top of the organization and I can see three main plants within this organization and I've got color indications. Now that is telling me the health state of the worst machine in that plant. Um, I have a timeline here of the notifications that the system has been sending out. These can be delivered to you in the format of, of an email or a direct connection through to a maintenance management system. Um, but one view that you might want to look at is a, an overall assessment of the health of the assets that you have within your plant. And uh, here we can see a list of the various assets with their current health state. Okay. Now that health state is recalculated on a regular basis and can change over time. Um, I'll just navigate down to uh, this asset and we can have a quick look. So we can go straight down to the asset and we can start to see that there have been some problems on this asset over time and uh, its current health state. But if I go back up, um, <clears throat> some of these assets will have had problems over the past few days or weeks, and we'll have sent out notifications related to those. So if I look at the case list here, we can see I've got this machine that's got its current health state as being very low, but there's some other machines in here that have experienced um, low health within the, the last few days that we can see. So this is a chart here that's showing me the health state as we've been tracking that for the machine over time. Um, and again, I can, uh, I can utilize this to get a little bit more information, start to look at some of the insights that are here, and then navigate out to that machine. And what we can also see is there's been a maintenance event carried out on this machine as well. So uh, if I, I can utilize this link, and it will take me down to that asset, I can get a little bit more detail about it. So in this case, it's vibration monitoring that's that's being conducted on uh, this CNC lathe, and we're being um, we're receiving various measures through from that end system, and we can see here an example of a single insight that has been generated against this machine. One thing that uh, you can see in here, because of the type of condition indicators we're getting, we can start to relate these to possible failure modes and actions uh, that could be taken. And this is information that's um, seeded expert knowledge that we can work with our customers to build into the system for them, to try and um, guide and advise the maintenance teams as best as possible. Um, and in addition, what we're seeing here is we've actually got a prognostic forecast on this machine. Now, as I explained, this is a demonstration data set and uh, this machine actually cycles through failures quite regularly. And it's, al it's already showing the early signs of, of, of uh, the need for intervention within the next 28 days because we're matching up to the beginning signs of a future failure mode. 
On the insights, because everything we do is data driven and utilizes machine learning, um, we need ways of receiving feedback from the end user. Um, and we've implemented um, the, the simple feedback mechanism that you can see here, where if this was useful to the user, they can select more like this and submit that feedback into the system. If this was something that was not useful, it might be the case that it was uh, maybe some uh, you know, startup action or an action that they know was taken by the operator and it actually forms normal behavior. They can feedback less like this. Now that information then ends up in our, our database and within Sensei associated to this sensor and our machine learning will utilize that. It's part of its evaluation and then it will perform an optimization cycle once it has sufficient feedback into the system. A very, a second and very important thing for us is uh, to have maintenance events captured in the system. Now, we have uh, implemented uh, this uh, screen that you can see here, which is to capture work events. Our, our hope and our vision is that we users don't have to use this screen within our application. We have cases where we actually connect directly through to computerized maintenance management systems. And we want that single flow and single work action performed by the maintenance team. We, we don't like the idea of what I call a swivel seat interface where the maintainer has to enter the data into the CMMS and then into the data again into our system. We would like to receive that over an API. In some cases with projects that we're working on, that's not possible. Um, either the data isn't accessible to us uh, during the current process or the, the customer doesn't have a suitable computerized maintenance management system. Hence, we use this uh, screen here in those cases. But to give you an idea of the sort of things that we, are, uh, we want to understand about machines, we want to understand the type of um, action being applied. So was it a routine scheduled event? And that will start, that, that, that tells us that the changes in behavior that we see are, are potentially expected and normal. You know, it could be the fact that the, there's been a scheduled replacement of um, something like a gearbox for an overhaul. It might be a 12 monthly overhaul, for an example. What are the, the type of maintenance events that are much more interesting though are the non-routine maintenance events. These are the things that potentially drive downtime and reflect um, unexpected failures in the machines. Um, what we also want to know is the, the, the level of the work that was carried out. So the activity, <clears throat> was it as simple as a visual inspection of the machine or was it a complete replacement of the machine? Now we have some logic put in place to say if you've completely replaced the machine, probably we want to relearn the new behavior. So we've got a warning that comes up here saying if you select that it's a replacement, we'll actually go into a relearning phase and learn the new behavior of this machine. We also um, perform that if you perform a, a reconfiguration of the machine. So if you change the process or the programming of the machine, we'll want to relearn as well. Okay. But in this case, it might have been a repair. Um, we, replaced the, we might have replaced the bearing. Um, so, and <coughs> the, the bearing uh, could have been as a result of um, let me just pick something that's, oh, maybe a vibration problem from the bearing. Um, this now puts a marker into our data set for us to drive more prognostic learning and calculate more remaining useful light information. Um, along with our users, we've discussed the type of metrics that we should be capturing that will be uh, useful to, to them going forward that we can build into future management reporting capability, for example. So, we're interested to understand the amount of uh, labor and man hours spent performing these type of tasks. So it might have been two hours to replace this um, bearing um, was required, maybe over a weekend. And another metric that <coughs> we find very interesting is uh, an assessment of the avoided downtime. Now, th this, this is actually something that's very subjective and, and it's just an, uh, a value that's maybe from the experience from the maintenance team. They're, if they've seen this type of failure before that's actually run to failure uh, and, and caused downtime, we want to have an estimate from them of, of what that actually was. 
um, it assists our users in understanding the benefits that they're getting from the system. Um, so it might be the case that they've seen this type of failure before, they haven't had the opportunity to replace the bearing during some scheduled downtime, um, and it resulted in the past maybe in um, a, a three hour stoppage of the production line. Um, now we'd sort of recommend that maybe they would be slightly conservative in their estimate, and, uh, and put in maybe 50% of that downtime avoided. So we capture a metric of uh, one hour 30 in downtime avoided in this case. Okay, and I'll just submit that into the system. Okay. Um, when we want to assess the asset at a slightly higher level, when we're here, we, if we come out, we can see um, that we have charts available for all the, all the various metrics that we're monitoring against this machine. The system tries to assist the user and orders the charts with the most recent uh, insights, but we can sort that and just look at them based on the chart titles and see the various measures that we have within the system for this machine. Okay. Um, and also what we'd want uh, users to do is to uh, close off a lot of these insights. So I can see I've got a number of insights that are actually sitting here as open. We want we provide a bulk closing feature. So actually just let's close off all the insights for the last 28 days. Um, we can go through a process here where it encourages me to add some information. So if there is a work event, I've already added that. So I can move forward here. It encourages me to provide feedback. I've already provided feedback on the most relevant insight so I can move forward and then we can apply that change um, and close that off. <clears throat> One thing that is useful now is when we start to look back at our health chart. Just let this refresh one second. Um, we can see all our markers that are grayed off and we can see the, the maintenance event in there that we've uh, captured. Apologies everyone for the audio quality. Um, I'm just gonna go back to sharing my screen. Andy, can you please confirm that you can still hear me? Yes, I can, yeah. Okay, perfect. Did you experience that audio, audio uh, issue as well? Yeah, yeah, I did, yeah. Fine. Further Rob's end. That's fine. Um, I, I, we'll just give him a chance to, to, to log back in and sort himself, sort himself out. Um, I will come back, in, come back in at this stage again and just uh, go through the last, last few slides and then when Rob's ready, uh, he can jump back again before we go through the Q&A session. We haven't got very, many, very much time left, so I will continue. Okay, so when it comes to actually working with us, we like to work with companies that are happy to work in the cloud and that have access, as we've mentioned several times, that have access to sensor data. So the typical kind of uh, that we're after is current voltage, torque, speed, temperature, uh, vibration, and so forth, along with the uh, event and maintenance information. Um, also, we're not a replacement for um, a condition monitoring predictive maintenance team. Uh, we do uh, um, uh, look to work with companies that have a, main, a predictive maintenance culture in place. And then uh, also uh, that we work with companies that actually understand and are able to quantify their unplanned downtime. In terms of how we actually engage with our clients uh, on the roadmap to success, or as I've called it here, the engagement for success, we go through a series of phases, um, so typically from phase zero to phase three. And what I'm saying there by phase, phase zero is that we start off with a data gathering and initial setup learning analysis phase, uh, where we can already uh, derive insights within two weeks. The next phase would be then to scale that up to the shop from just one pilot up to the shop and then from the, from the shop up to the plant and then from the plant uh, across multiple sites globally. Um, I've introduced an initial uh, data gathering phase, uh, which is where companies like Wonderware help with uh, aggregating the data, and providing the information uh, from, from all the assets, whether that's PLCs, um, plant assets themselves and sensors.
Andy, do you have anything you'd like to add at that, uh, uh, on that point there? Uh, no, I think, I think that's covered it. And I think I covered it as part of my slides. I think just connecting to all those, those devices, that's what we do at that local level. Yeah, okay. So I guess what I'm trying to say here is it's not only a predictive, scale, uh, predictive scalable predictive maintenance uh, um, product that we offer, but also a scalable phased rollout procedure. And we ensure that at, each, at the end of each of the phases, that there are several review sessions throughout and that each, at the end of each phase, there is uh, the value demonstrated as we go through that path with you. Okay, just to take you through some of the uh, key markets that we work in and some of the public testimonials. So we are present in um, FM, the uh, fast moving consumer goods space. Uh, automotive is obviously a very big uh, uh, area for us. It's obviously where predictive maintenance is very well understood for the, for the reasons I mentioned uh, before. Um, plastics, metals, aerospace, pharmaceutical, energy, defense, renewable, logistics, waste, and oil and gas. And uh, some of the key logos that, are, that I am allowed to share, um, uh, one of our biggest customers is Nissan and SKF. We also work with Tata and Schneider Electric and MTC. Um, so you may well know SKF from uh, the, the bearing manufacturers. They have their own practice of condition monitoring and consulting that they offer. But even they, as uh, condition monitoring experts, use us for the scalability aspect. So we provide them with all the insights and they then drill deeper into some of those insights. Some of the key benefits that have been achieved by some of our customers, I've just picked a few. Uh, we've, uh, we've attract, uh, so attracted, um, yeah, so, so our customers have been attracted to our strong prognostics and yeah. machine learning. Uh, we've achieved uh, ROIs within four months uh, and, and on target to achieve re uh, a reduction in downtime by 50% and beyond. Um, introduced areas to avoid downtime as well as uh, reduce the, uh, the, the amount of technician involvement. And some key takeaways. Um, it's uh, that, that I would like you to yeah yeah to take away um, is that the application is easy to use. There's no technical knowledge that's required or necessary. Uh, zero touch configuration, other than the very 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 basic things that uh, that uh, Rob has shown you in terms of uh, adding sensors and turning signals on and off. Um, where uh, I've seen the it's, we take a data driven approach. Um, we um, use the power of machine learning and prognostics to really under help you understand the remaining useful life of your machines. We've embedded our mechanical know-how. Uh, it's a cloud-based application, so you can get uh, underway straight away. Uh, it's scalable uh, from tens to thousands of machines. Um, and uh, we take a, a, fa a phased, as I just mentioned before, um, a phased uh, approach to deployment. And we're providing access to all sites, right? All uh, to all insights across the site from all sources. Um, and just to take you through some of some of the uh, some of the um, metrics at the bottom: 58 percent uh, increase in downtime forecasting accuracy. The type of things we've we've helped customers with: 10 to 40 percent um, lower in in, in uh, reduction in in maintenance costs, as well as a 30 to 50 percent reduction in in downtime. A 45 to 50% increase in maintainer productivity. Before I go into question time, I'm going to ask my colleague Rob to see whether he's back online um, and whether he still wants to continue where he where he left off from the from the uh, demonstration. Rob, are you still with us? I hope you can hear me now. Yes, I can. Um, yeah. We have uh, basically we have uh, what, eight minutes left. Um, was there a, what, was there a, were there a few more things you quickly wanted to show before I go on to the questions? We have to overrun very slightly. Uh, um, I, th I think I think it's probably best we just uh, move on to the Q and A. If anybody um, okay. does want a, a chat and a, uh, and, a, and a demo, I can set up a specific session. Fine. Okay. In that case, I'm going to. Um, find my controls to allow uh, unmute the microphones if I can find out where uh, so I'm going to unmute at this stage all microphones hopefully that doesn't cause too much noise disruption so we're now um, happy to take your questions <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, so I've just noticed, I'm just going to put the people yep. on mute for one thing. I've got a question. Oh, my name is Dominic Nixon. Oh, then. And you know. Yeah. I'm going to put everyone on mute again, and I'm going to ask uh, um, Rob to help me answer these questions. So I've got a question here. Do you keep the data gain segregated between companies or use it in, uh, in aggregate? Rob, would you like to take yeah. that question? Yes, yeah, so, so the, 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 the data at the moment is, uh, is, is well bounded between customers. Um, we, um, we, we are in discussions where we, we, we believe that there's learning that can be taken across various machines, um, but that, that would actually be done with the permissions of various uh, customers. We, what we do find though is, is we can share data across um, different parts of organizations. So with uh, the example of, uh, of Nissan, um, we, we can take learning from one plant and start to um, assess and apply that in another plant. Okay, I've got another question here. Can you please clear who, uh, can you please um, give us an understanding of who's providing the IoT middleware and gateway? Okay, so, yes, so um, in a general context, um, each of our customers have quite different solutions in place. <clears throat> um, but uh, in, in the context of uh, this um, webinar here, you know, we, we do have set solutions that we have in place and running utilizing, uh, you know, in, in Wonderware uh, and, and Wonderware gateways. Maybe, maybe um, Andy, if you could, it might be useful for you to explain what you do in that area. Yeah, sure. So um, I suppose really when you're looking at things like IoT middleware or gateways, we're really talking about edge computing. Um, so it's just that real-time processing of data from the local level before it is applied to the to, to the centralized hosted solution. So that could be that you're actually aggregating data at that level and we have lots of different ways that we can do that, um, you know, from starting from very, very small going up to the, the larger enterprise type solutions. And um, just going back to your data being segregated through aggregation, um, from a Wonderware perspective in that, uh, we, we do keep it separate per customer. Um, and when Sensei log into the um, system, they only see the data for that data set that we provided. So it's not a case of Sensei would have access to all of our customers that are using our cloud historian. They only have access to the, the to the customer that that wants it or wants that predictive maintenance on there. Okay, thank you very much for that. I've got a couple more questions. Uh, I've come through the chat box. So I think it's probably the most the, the the best method, by the way, for those that want, wish to ask questions. If you type them into the chat box rather than me open up the microphones, it's uh, there's an awful lot of background noise. Um, so the next question is, can you detect complex behavior of machines that may lead to failures that hum human operators can't detect? One for you, Rob? Yeah, so, so that, that's um, exactly one of the reasons that we set Sensei up. Uh, and, and, the way, and the reason that we use data-driven approaches opposed to um, embedding a lot of physical models of machines that you would find in more traditional approaches. Um, some great examples have been related to things that aren't necessarily machines fail, failing, but where they've been misconfigured and the behavior changes uh, subtly, but enough that um, could potentially result in failure. So maybe the uh, modifications not being applied properly when, when during machine upgrades. Um, and uh, we do have examples where we've picked up very subtle changes to machines um, where it has been the early stages of failures and has provided customers with advanced warning um, way before the machines get close to thresholds that users would normally set on various measures such as uh, temperatures or current or torque. Thanks for that, Rob. I've got another question here. Uh, so it says here, for the work orders and work data capture through Sensei, um, are these, uh, I think the way I read this question is that, is that, is that, is that information sent back into the historians? Right. So, so, so currently the work orders um, that, that we capture um, stay within our system, but we do see um, requirements where you, you might want that information pushed back into your maintenance management solution. Um, the, the issue there is that you might end up with a, um, a confusing workflow for the, for the maintainer 
if the maintainer has been trained to utilize um, you know, the, the company's maintenance management solution, you would probably want that as the prime entry point for the data. Um, but we, 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 we can expose APIs to push that data back if it would be, if it's required for a customer. Just to enhance on that, Rob, um, from a from a Wonderware perspective, we do have a business process management solution that works at the industrial level. So not only can you do things like work orders from um, events that have happened on the plant floor, but because of that API that you have, um, although we haven't actually tested it, uh, you know, it's there's no reason why we couldn't get the the events captured from Sensei and then also trigger work orders at our end too. Yep. That, that makes sense. Uh, and, and what we actually do is the, the output of Sensei, we can push that back to solution like that to provide notifications that maintenance planners can then escalate to work orders. So we can we can actually drive the, uh, the, the workflow within a maintenance management system. Thanks, Father Rob. I've got another question here. Is it possible to have the success story about what you have done with Nissan as part of the alliance, Ren the alliance with Renault and Nissan in France. Um, so there's a bit of a interest there from a Renault perspective. Yeah, uh, I, I'm not sure how much of that we can talk about in this sort of domain publicly, but um, uh, JBF, if uh, it, it, um, we would be more than happy to have a one-to-one -one conversation there. Um, just to give you a very high level overview, that project has been going on since 2016. Um, we started out with a general analysis of uh, a small number of machines and that is scaled up to um, cover multiple sites now for Nissan and uh, running into the thousands of machines. Okay, thanks. Um, I'll continue with a few more. Uh, I've just come through. Uh, I'm not sure how quite how to re read this question, but I'll read it out as it is. Typically, are there su uh, sufficient existing sensors to provide meaningful data from a customers assets yes so um we realized that you know the market in this uh, set in this sense is uh, maturing significantly and there is a, a, a greater increase in the deployed sensors there, there's two actually probably three aspects where uh, that, that, that can assist there's uh, you know a move to create low cost sensors that can be retrofitted to machines um, there's also the ability to extract data from existing process and control systems. Um, and then we see a move now where new assets are actually being delivered with industrial IoT capability. Um, I think, you know, it, it was, as, as we are a young, early stage company, um, if the market was completely mature, um, we would be struggling to keep up um, so we're on a journey with the with the rest of the sector um. okay thanks another question around security uh, you mentioned security um, uh, AES 256 so is it 256-bit encryption is this used in transit and at rest at all points in the cloud can you provide provable security assurances when data is held in the public cloud yeah so, so uh, yeah all, all our data is encrypted um, in transit um, and we actually go through with various customers security audits um, and we have uh, third party um, providers that, that, that um, run penetration tests on our system uh, where those reports can be um, made accessible to customers as well. Um, yeah, and, and, and we, we've, we go through um, various <laughs> processes where we provide the evidence needed by customers IT and security departments so uh, we, we'd be quite happy to go into that sort of process with any new client. Okay in the the next question in the case of of a replacement of an old component with a new one or or a new machine how do you provide reliable insights while historical data may not be available? Yeah, so, so in that case, we, we need a minimum learning period. It's as if it's um, like a brand new green field sensor. Um, and that learning period um, can be as short as two weeks. Um, typically, what uh, we see with clients as part of their maintenance policy 
regardless of having something like Sensai, would be for them to perform maybe an, uh, uh, an inspection or a check after that machine's been fitted. So they would be returning to it. Um, but it's made clear to the user that this, the system will be um, blind to that machine while it's learning for that two week period. And then we would start generating insights. Um, <clears throat> one thing that we're working on at the moment is a change to the user interface to make it far more um, visible to the user as to which machines are in this learning phase. We feel that's very important. Okay, thank you for that, Rob. Another question that's come in, do you use transfer learning between components that share uh, some similarities? Oh, that's a good point, actually. Yeah, we've, we've done a lot of uh, research into this area, um, looking at large populations of assets and how we can assess similarity. And it's a, it's a, it's a very, it's a very yeah, good question, actually, because the natural tendency would be to look at things like the make and model of the machine and assume that they're similar. We actually um, have been researching the assessment of similarity based purely on the data that's streaming through. Um, and then we can see that once you have that assessment of similarity, there's an opportunity then to start to share things like our prognostic models across the, the machine population. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, I don't have any more questions. And I think we've overrun a little bit, which I think is, is fine. But uh, unless any other quick questions come through, I may close the call in a minute or so. Yeah. Lars, can you make sure that you put up contact details on the screen for anybody that wants to follow up with uh, any questions? Yes, of course. I Thank you that. It's probably in the covering, a covering slide, so I'll, I'll switch back to that. So, yep, here we go right at the beginning. Should you wish to ask more questions, please do get in contact with, with us directly. Uh, the email addresses are on the, on the bottom of this slide. We will, of course, follow up on all those who attended and provide you a link to this recorded webinar, um, as well as address all those that couldn't make it for whatever reason. Um, I will, at this point, um, Thank you. I would like to thank you all for, for joining the session and also to my two presenters. Thank you, Rob and Andy, for helping me put this together. Thanks, Lars. Absolute pleasure. Thanks okay. very much, Rob. Okay, well, thanks very much. I hope you enjoyed that. We'll be in contact and I'm going to close the session there. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye. Bye now.